welcome again to Who's Who in Southern Alberta. Well, again, our guest this week, I'm sure, is, is somebody you're all going to recognize. Maybe he painted your house uh, in one of his 37 years, or maybe you saw him on television coming from who knows around the world. Of course, it's Josh Senda. Josh, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for inviting me. And of course, uh, you're a person we've been trying to get on this program for about a year, I think. Uh, we've been harassing you to get you on, and finally, here you are. I'd, I'm, I want to start off with maybe some background. I know when you first came, um, there was no such thing as judo in, in southern Alberta, I guess, and uh, now you have an international reputation and you're doing all kinds of things. So let me just start by, uh, maybe you could tell me how you got into it and uh, where you were raised and so on. Well, first of all, I was born in Mission City, B.C., uh, way back in 1922. That's given my age, but <laughs> however. And when I was about eight or nine, I started judo there. Was there a lot of judo uh, being done there? Uh, yes, in the Pacific Coast. Mm -hmm. Most of the judo in Canada was in the Pacific Coast in those days. Now, was it just Japanese people that were involved in the mm -hmm. judo there, or was it...? Well, mostly, but not necessarily. We had the RCMP taking judo and you know, oh, other sorry. people taking judo, too. Oh. Not as much as now, but mm -hmm. they were taking it then. So did you ri rise right up the ranks uh, at the time when you were young? Yes, as a junior and so on up to the juveniles and uh, seniors. Hmm. Now you came uh, from Mission City. By the way, maybe we should pinpoint where Mission City is. It's about 40 miles in from Vancouver. And during the war, uh, they moved you out of there. Is yes, that what happened? Yes, in 1942 we were moved. We chose, my father was a farmer, so we chose the agriculture by coming here to do sugar beets. We had a choice, you see. So we Did came you, to I see you, so you came directly from Mission City to, yeah. to, uh, to the little town up north here, Noble Fort. Oh yeah, yes. yeah. Now, um, what, what were the conditions like? Pretty bad? Well, it was very bad. Well, I don't want to go into all the details, <laughs> it was very bad. <laughs> That's been well yeah. publicized in well, books and so one on. One example is where we moved, we moved right into the chicken coop. Is that right? first arrived, yeah. Hmm. Now, um, you say that when you came into southern Alberta, you started judo. How long after you were here did it start? And, uh, yes, 42, I worked on sugar beets in Novo Fort, and then in 1943, there's a gentleman in Raymond, south from here. Mm -hmm. He uh, was a judo instructor, and he c called me up to see if he would come assist him. So I took the offer and went down there and started the first judo club in Alberta, 1943. How many did you have, do you remember? Uh, well, I think we started about, about 20 people, you know, kids. They start to grow. What age limit, or what, what age uh, were people were mostly interested in? About seven years up. Yeah. And uh, you went into competition right away, or was it just uh, sort of... Not, not re right away, because, uh, you know, uh, r survival was the most important thing at those days, because, you know, we just came without, without nothing. So most of, most of the thing was trying to survive. And about five years later, the competition start, started, and I competed here and there. Hmm. Now, you, you also started a painting firm. You got into the home decorating. Yes, this gentleman that was teaching judo was a painter, you see. So I apprenticed under him for six, seven years. Then I started my business in Lesbridge in 1952. I moved here in 52. And it was a full-time thing for many, many years then? Yes. yes. I just retired a couple of years ago. Oh, I see. The, um, this is inside painting, uh, no, outside, no, both. whatever, eh? In, inside and out. Did you do, ever do landscape painting, that type of painting no, at all? No, no. All right, so um, then the, when did the real interest start in, in judo in the year? You know, well, when I moved here in 52, I started the club at the old YMC mm -hmm. on 4th Avenue there. It's all torn down now, but I was there for about night was the old Y and the new Y, I was there about 19 years, you know, voluntary work with judo. Then when the university was built, I moved up there because the facility was a lot larger, you know, to have more people do judo then. Who are some of the people that have done, you know, I know Greenway comes to mind, and who, but who are these people that, uh, some of the students you've had over the years? Well, um, just to pick uh, the major ones are, of course, we had a lot of national champions, but major ones in 1972, we had Phil Ellingworth represent Canada in the Olympics in Munich. In 76, Tom Greenway and Joe Melly represented Canada at the Montreal Olympics. 
I, I went as a manager that time. In 1980, uh, also Tom Greenway and uh, Joe Milley were selected to represent Canada at the Moscow Olympics. I was to go as a coach, but uh, unfortunately it was boycotted. We didn't make it. Oh, yeah, that's and then a tough one. Eighty-four. I also got two more students, Joe Melly and Fred Blaney, from here represent the Los Angeles Olympic, and I went as a coach that time. And in '88, of course, Joe went to Seoul Olympics. Okay. Those are the major ones. And how many how many people do you have in the, in an average year? In the class, yeah. we have uh, you know kids and so on ages so. Total will be about 140, 150 ki uh, not kids, but the adults do it, total. Yeah. Now there's always some, of course, that take it very seriously and some that uh, yes. just sort of come by. Um, what would be the average length of time that uh, they would stay in, a pro in the program? Uh, well, you know, like for example, Joe and Tom, they stayed a long time. That's why they're up there. Yeah. But some take it about two years and they give it up, mostly recreation judo. But uh, quite a few are still in the about 10 years yet. I see. The, um, okay, so now you've, you started the Y and then you went to the university. Were you also connected with the college at all in the, in uh, the judo? Not, not in the sense of having a club there, but I was asked to do some judo there, teaching the um, uh, law enforcement class there for a couple of years. You were mentioning that uh, even back in the days in Mission BC that the police, the mounted police, I guess, were taking yes. judo as a method of obviously <laughs> survival in their you case. Know, I just remember <laughs> those days. I was, you know, about young, yeah, sixteen or so. I was, it wasn't very big yeah. to do with somebody that's, you know, <laughs> so big. Our CMP people. I just remember there was no weight category in those days. You see. Oh, I yeah. see. So you all matched up with whoever <laughs> happened to come in the room. The um, the aspect that I wanted to talk about. Um, was what lots of people I'm sure are out there now wondering okay what's it all about I see somebody on TV and there's a he's wearing a white shirt and somebody's tugging away and mm -hmm. then somebody falls over what could you explain I know it's maybe difficult without an example but what is uh, going on out there well um, we have a you know special judo uniform really thick so that you know there's lots of pull in it is it made very firm so they don't rip and when you say this pull in it, do you mean it stretches or do you no, just mean it's no, tough? Tough, it's really tough. Must because be. Because you grab both hands and really pull to throw the opponent over your shoulder or whatever, you see. So uh, it's got to be made very tough. Well, in judo, um, in competitions, you win by actually throwing a person over with we, we'll speed and force onto the mat. That's, that's a full point, in other words, and then the match is finished. Also, if you happen to trip a guy and then go over very good, you follow through with a hold down, you know, secure him for a hold, pin him down for 30 seconds, then you're a winner again. And also, if you have a chance to do some chokes till they give up, that's another point of winning too. They're actually choking somebody, are they? Yes. And arm bars too. So this is not playing around, this is for <laughs> no. real stuff. That's why, especially when you teach the little ones, we never teach them choking cause, or arm bars because they're not up there to really you know, appreciate what they're doing. Otherwise, be, you know, might choke them out or whatever. Well, that's what I was going to say. Do, do you have times when they, somebody actually just passes out right on the, right the, on the mat? Competition, yes. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Hmm. The, um, are the costumes, I call them costumes, you call them uniforms. Are they always white? This yes, is it's, it signifies purity. Oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, the the uh, background of the sport, I assume, is, is Japanese. Yeah, it started uh, in 1882 in uh, Tokyo. Uh, the master named Professor Kano started judo in 1882. So it's not very old then. It's no, not a, not really. It's a hundred and some odd years. He was the ardent student of jujitsu. You see, in Japan, those they had various uh, instructors teaching different ways of jiu-jitsu and then he figured that those moves are very dangerous for just ordinary person to learn so he put all the good parts together and started what you call kodokan judo oh, where the kids are opposite sex anybody can practice old age or whatever was jiu-jitsu was that a sport as well or was that Not a, really a defense, a defense. you break your arm or whatever <laughs> and then there's all these other things that uh, they talk about that seem to have an oriental um, uh, 
kickboxing or whatever these things are. There's, all <laughs> yeah, there's Taekwondo from Korea and, you know, Karate uh, karate. from Okinawa. You know, there's lots of other type of... Uh, but the mine is judo. <laughs> uh, and is, are all these other sports, would you say karate was a sport too, or, or is it sort of, again, self-defense? Oh, gosh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say too much about the other sports because I don't know too much about it. We actually they hit or kick or whatever it is. Are, they, are these other sports in the, <coughs> in the Olympics at all? The taekwondo <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I see. The, um, how long has uh, judo been part of the Olympics? For many years? In 1964. Started first uh, in judo at the Tokyo Olympics. And is that the one, one of the ones you were at or not? No, I wasn't there, no. No, I never competed in the Olympics. No, but Mostly you, uh, coaching. Yeah, and your first coaching job at the Olympics, or if you were the manager one year, you mentioned. And I was 76, and then I was a national coach from 78 to 84. That means you looked after all the people from Canada. Yeah. See, we have four regional coaches. I was one of them. This was one of the centers here, you see, in those days. Mm -hmm. And we traveled all over and had training camps and whatnot. And, uh, and we take turns to go to Europe and all the major tournaments internationally, World Championship. And uh, 1981, I was a coach for the World Championship in, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the city, but in Holland. And that's the first time that Canada won two medals internationally since Doug Rogers won one in 1964 at the Tokyo Olympics. So that's a 17-year span, and we start to rise from there. And then the following year, I took the uh, um, Canadian University team to the World University Championship in Finland, Javaskala City. And we won three medals that time, so th we were really coming up that time. And then the 80 Olympics, we were, you know, we were going to make it, but unfortunately it was cancelled. So. Hmm. Who the, who's the biggest competition uh, that you have in the Olympics? Well, it used to be Japan like this, but now it's every country in the world has got medals. Eh? Like, uh, for example, Germany, France, uh, Britain, Holland, all the kind of Russia, you know, Korea. So it's spread all over. That's how judo spread all over. More equal now. It used to be one-sided, but now it's... Uh, now you say there's different weight categories. Yes. So, um, uh, some countries, I assume, that Japanese aren't, don't have as big a build as, as some of these other Oh, no, members. they, they are big. Oh, they are big. They <laughs> are big. Yeah, in my days, in Japan, not very big. But, oh, you go there <laughs> so now, they've really they grown lots huge, of cornflakes. Huge, huge people. 300 pounders, 350 pound taking judo. And in the open weights, you know, they're big. Okay, so this, this uh, leads us to another question. What about uh, the steroids and this type of thing? Is this going on in, in, in that area, do you think? Well, not in Canada, not Canadian judo, but there are in some. Uh, not too long ago, somebody from the uh, United States was caught, and then somebody from Britain was caught too. So it would be something that would, would give a person an advantage to have that extra weight, or would it give it? Because they're in different weight categories anyway, aren't they? Well, uh, I don't know too much about that. I don't believe in that myself, but... Uh, you know, listening to the track and field, Ben Johnson, all that, it seems like the body is really big. I guess they would have some advantage, but... But then they're going to be in, they're going to be in a weight class with other people that are just as big. Yes, yes. So... There's mm, seven yeah. weight categories, you see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there a certain um, type of personality that lends itself to a competitive person in, in judo? Uh, well... <laughs> You have to have some natural talent too, you know, natural ability. And what type of things would you, you know, look for? We, if we are versatile in other sports too. And, oh, you I know, see. Uh, the, um, agility and all that. And a, a lot of it, I guess, is dedication. Eh? They, oh, they yes. really want yes. to, uh, really want to go places. Dedication and, and you know, the right spirit, that kind of a never give up spirit. Hmm. You know. The um, are there certain Types of people, certain groups of people that are, that seem to be that have this more than others. Um, uh. I know. Well, for example, I remember when the when the, you're talking about the Japanese when they came into this area, um, the people, the young people, were very very interested in getting places. They mm. were very good students in this type yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, is there certain groups of people that you say, hey, you know, I'd love to have that person because they they have the stick to itness. 
Well, like you say, the Japanese people do have, you know, in their culture that way too, so they have yeah. a little bit of advantage there. Yeah. And, well, the people in the Orient have that sort of a spirit. So the, there might even be a little philosophy is in, involved in all this, eh? a way of thinking that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, helps that helps in, in, in this uh, Yeah, well, you see, in, ja in Japan, the training is a little different than here. Eh? They're all, of course, they're changing now, but in, what, 15 years ago, I've been to Japan many times as a team, mm -hmm. and for the very first time and now, the, the, their attitude is different. Attitude is going oh, down. You know, I remember one time I <laughs> we went to one of the university. I heard about it, but I didn't believe it till I saw, you know, the coaches. They, you know, there's, you know, the mat, we fight on a little mat like that. Mm -hmm. And there's some cement floor on the edge there. Boy, <laughs> this one guy just took after this guy and just slammed all over the wall and all over the cement floor and everything. You know, that kind of a um, coaching or whatever, I don't believe in. Hmm. And that thing's sort of not uh, happening very much now. One of the things they used to say about our culture, and they probably still do, is that um, we get, we're getting lazy and uh, we can't be bothered uh, uh, anymore, you know, maybe too much television, who cares, attitude. Have you found that uh, this is permeating in, in judo as well? Yes, yeah, especially in the little, you know, younger, younger generations. Once they surpass that stage, then they're okay, but a lot of kids are that way right now. So they have to, you have to reach a certain level, mm -hmm. and then and then they they seem to mm -hmm. to go places. See, we have a belt system in judo. You see, like you know, karate or anybody anything other sports too. That helps a little bit. You know, as you progress, progress, you get a different higher rank, and then when they feel that they're getting higher, and then they really go at it more. What is the top belt? The black belt? No. Uh, no. Um, judo starts from a white belt, and there there's many yellow, orange, green, blue brown and then you take a provincial exam to get your black belt and then from the black belt you go on stages to 10th degree black belt 10th is the highest in the world so f from first degree to fifth degree is all black belt about sixth degree and up is a checkered red and white belt, belt. Mm. six seven eight and then from ninth and tenth degree is all black all red all red and how many of these top of the line people would there be in the world? I think there's only one living in the world that's got 10th degree. I was forced to meet him in August when I was in Japan too. And is, is he getting on in age now? Or well, he's retired. He's right. retired yeah. Is uh, judo something that you can keep on doing yes. you know, all your life more I, or less? It doesn't, doesn't come know, to the point where your bones are too brittle and you shouldn't no, be? No. Once, well, when you start like me at eight years old, I'm, you know, I'm steady, never stop, it seemed to, you know, Seems to be all you right. don't have to fight it. You know, when you get older, you got other things to do: teach or coach or we have so what you call the uh, forms of judo. You can participate in. You know how well you can perform the techniques and all that. Hmm. Now, when you first arrived in, in Southern Alberta and you started that first um, judo club, did you have any idea that everything would grow to the extent that it has? No, no not really. <laughs> I mean, it's been just been going <coughs> up and up every year, yeah. hasn't it? See, I really like, I really like to compete. I was a real, you know, mm -hmm. competitive. I really like to compete. And since we moved here, I had to stop for a while because of the, you know, survival and all this. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, st still, after five years, I did compete when I was about 30, 35. I quit competing when I was 39, provincially and all that. But um, my peak time was the, the war just killed it because I was 20. Oh, yeah. Maybe. So in, in that sense, since I couldn't compete anymore, then I went to coaching and tried to bring other people up and then really, yeah. really happy that to see some of the kids really came up. Which country um, that you're familiar with would you say had the best um, audience, the people that were most into watching judo? You know, amazing when you go to Europe, that big stadium is just jam-packed you know, 20, 30,000, just packed with spectators. Hmm. So. so there's really a lot of uh, audience interest in, in, yeah, Europe. in Europe. Yeah, I don't know why, what the reason is, but judo isn't quite a spectator sport. You know, I guess we have to sell it, I guess, but, mm -hmm. you know, in Canada, 
And Japan is a pretty good crowd too, but then Europe is just amazed to see so many people. How about the United States compared with Canada? About uh, the same? The United States is a little bit more, you know, more spectators. How about South America? Is there... Yeah, Brazil is very strong. Brazil, yeah. Hmm. And you know, going back to Europe, France is very, very popular in judo. They have... And I heard that... What, what is their main sport in France? I can't remember what it was. Judo is number two in the national hmm. sport. How about girls? Is there such a thing as girls in judo? Yeah. Uh, the w women are accepted into the 1992 Olympics. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, in Korea, it was a demonstration sport. Has it been just the last few years that uh, they got involved in it, or is it, have, have women been in it for...? No. Uh, well, they have been, but not real competitive like. But it's the last, what, six, seven years that they really come in up. They have world championships and whatnot. So, so where do you hope to be five, ten years now? Where, <laughs> what's, what's next? Where do you go from here? I'll probably still be teaching judo here. <laughs> <laughs> but you really love it, I guess, eh? Yes, I do. Well, the, uh, you know, how the kids come up and all that, then it's for your exercise too, it's really good. Now, you were mentioning some of the people that, uh, that have really gone far. Uh, some of those people must be getting up into the 30s and 40s yeah. by now, eh? It's like Joe Melly, he's retired now from fighting after the Seoul Olympics. But Tom Greenway is still carrying on. He's a heavyweight, so if the heavyweights seem to go a little longer in age, you know, competitively, but if you're in a 60, 65, 71 kilo division, when you get 30 years old, that's too, you're too old. Mm. It's 26, 27 is a peak time for that. And I assume that there's a very closeness that you have with these ex-students of yours that yeah. they come and see you all the time. and mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah. nice. Well, they it? still come out to practice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, some of our, you know, the black belt, black belt, when they got the black belt, they moved all over to it. They're all over the place now. Mm. And then they're working out there, so, you know, it's... Um, I miss them, but still they're carrying on, so that's... You know, and when you go on thing. holidays, you, can, you, know, you have a place that you can stay. <laughs> <laughs> that's always nice. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming, Josh. Uh, uh, give a little bit of insight into the background and how you uh, came to be where you are today. And uh, I'm sure the people in, in Lethbridge are, are very thankful for all you've done to build the sport and uh, the reputation of, of Southern Alberta around the world. So thanks a lot for coming and good luck in the future. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting right. me. Welcome again to Who's Who in Southern Alberta. Well, our guest this time is, a, I should say, an old timer, but I'm sure he wouldn't like that. But he's been on the guest on the program at least three times, I think, Sweet. Evan, haven't you? Yes. Evan, Evan Gushel, he's the man a few years ago that brought a whole photographic studio here. And now he's bringing us some of the parts that were part of that studio. And of course, we're talking about the, the well-known Gushel studio in um, the Crow's Nest Pass. I guess it's in Blairmore, is it? Blairmore. Blairmore. Right. It's now an historic site, and it, tell me what is about the, we have a picture here, and we'll do our little picture thing right away, but tell us about the unusual lighting setup that's in this building. Well, the studio has the um, north light, it's a beautiful big skylight and a whole window on the north side, and it lets in the most beautiful light that you would ever want to experience. When you walk in there, it's, there's, there's it's like walking into a cathedral, you, you feel inspired. It's a beautiful light for artists, for photographers, for uh, one of the first people to use it under its new role, you might say, uh, since the university took it over, was uh, Mr. Papke, 
Cliff Babke from uh, McGill University, and uh, he did sculpting in the studio, and the lighting by which he could work was just so beautiful, and his sculpture just, uh, just lived in that. Right now, Barbara Wilson from Lethbridge is uh, using the place. It's a sort of an artist's retreat, you might say. They go there and they have uh, showings, and they work in cooperation with the Allied Arts Council in the past as well. Mm. And it's, it's really being put to good use now. Now this um, building was very unique when it was built, was it not? Yes. Uh, as it turned out, it was the only structure of its kind, or the only studio of its type, uh, in Western Canada. You might say as far from, maybe from Toronto West. In the larger cities, they had smaller setups of this, but ours was a large one with full north light exposure. And uh, we could accommodate large wedding groups in there. In fact, uh, we accommodated the Crowsness Pass Symphony for several years too. So far as floor space is concerned, it was uh, really wonderful. Now, was this something that was around before the advent of flash photography? Is this where it started? Um, studios of this type were used uh, you might say in conjunction with flash as well, but flash as a rule was used in places where they didn't have enough daylight and they used uh, the magnesium flash often with what they called a Heldorsen bag, which was a method of trapping the uh, magnesium oxide after the flash, this fine, fine powder. And instead of dusting everybody with this powder and having to let it go to one picture, uh, this bag served two purposes. It trapped the powder, and it also gave a nice, beautiful, soft, diffused light. Now, that light was a substitute, in essence, in these crowded places where they didn't have room to build a north light uh, on the, in their premises, you see. So we didn't have to use flash in that studio, but we did use flash when we went out, say, to a a banquet or uh, into a hall or a church or wherever we were called to take pictures even outdoors we used the uh, magnesium flash what year was the studio built my father started to build that studio around 1917 and it was around 1920 to 21 when it was uh, complete but he was already taking some pictures in it before it was uh, had arrived at the complete stage now, the building was, uh, after your folks uh, passed away, was it taken over by other families or...? or no, uh, when my father died in 62, my mother uh, kept the business up. She, she actually took pictures and did everything that she could up until she started to uh, fail in her health and she died in 81, but uh, she kept up for several years after my father had died. And then the building was uh, taken over by the Historical Resources yes. Foundation, mm -hmm. wasn't it? And uh, from there, what happened to it? Well, uh, Walter Kerber operated it as a studio for, for a short period of time, and then the Historical Resources Foundation uh, took the building back and decided to uh, do the restoration on it as, as it stands now. And now it's been taken over by At the University of Lethbridge? The University of Lethbridge uh, have uh, leased it for uh, a retreat for artists in residence. And uh, people come from different places and uh, they have the choice of going there. And many elect to go there. there Barbara Wilson presently is in there and we've had uh, four or five, six people there now. The, uh, with the big uh, t tourism complex, Echo Museum, uh, that they're developing in the Crow's Nest Pass, I assume that uh, more and more interest is happening all the time. Well, the, to the I know that the um, museum, what we, we call it the Crow's Nest Pass Museum, or the Coleman Museum, but it's located in Coleman. Uh, they, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, they, they've told me that uh, they have a replica of our studio done as one of their exhibits. Mm. And uh, we have already sent up 
uh, quite a bit of equipment in order that it will appear like the old Gushal studio. And uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a good step forward. Well, maybe we should look at a, a few pictures here of, um, that were, I'm sure some of them were produced in the studio itself. And I've got to make sure I don't miss the one with uh, Evan with his Beatles haircut. Oh. Where you, uh, <laughs> uh, much earlier than the Beatles even arrived. The, uh, this is uh, Thomas Gushel, uh stationery. Do not trust strangers peddling cheap photography from door to door. That's the bottom line of the stationery. Are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> well, <laughs> the message was quite clear there. Uh, we used to have what my father referred to as racketeers going through. These people would go through, uh, rent a room in a hotel, and take pictures. And uh, I know when I had my studio going in Coleman, the same thing happened to me there. I complained bitterly about it to the town council, made the headlines on the back, back page of the Calgary Herald over this. <laughs> but the thing was that the, uh, as long as they got permission from the chief of police to set up, that's all they needed. And it would clean out your baby business, so to speak, for about a year. And uh, it, it did hurt. So, uh, but the the, the um, ironical part was that uh, the work that these people did was not of good quality, and uh, the pictures would fade, and they would be very muddy, or there'd be mm -hmm. a, a lot of faults in them, and they would come to my father and complain. Look what I got. Look. He says, well, you should have come to me. Well, yeah, but you charge too much. He says, okay, what did you pay for those? <laughs> they always ended up that they had paid more. Is that right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, it did work out that in, in, in the later years, uh, that little slogan paid off because people uh, kept coming back to my father. I guess it's a problem that still exists today, oh, I, it's, I would uh, imagine. It's prevalent. Uh, you have that... Uh, they say free enterprise and yeah. competition yeah. is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's wonderful for the guy that comes <laughs> up on top. <laughs> that's right. Here's a picture of your um, father and mother I have here. I guess it's the same one that's in that yes, uh, it's, it's, article it's, over there. And he, how many years that was he doing his uh, photography? In? Well, he started actually in photography almost as soon as he came to Canada in 1906. Um, I think he got his first camera around 1908-1909 and he uh, uh, was experimenting with photography while he was working in the mines. Mm -hmm. His first, uh, one of his earlier jobs was working in the figure eight tunnel mm -hmm. and uh, at Revelstoke and mm -hmm. then he came down to the pass in 1909 after this stint and uh, stayed in the pass pretty well although he did come out uh, it was a sort of a seasonal thing I guess uh, worked at the uh, number eight mine here in Lethbridge at one time and then he came back to the pass and stayed there hmm. but uh, after an injury in the mine he decided that he was going to stay with photography and earn his living by that, and he never looked back. He just quit the mine and stayed there. Now, were all his, um, what do you call, all the pictures that he took, the negatives, have all those been preserved? Yes, uh, I would, well, yeah. we'll say all. Uh, what happened, Glenbow Museum uh, got the, uh, his collection, as they call it, and uh, we have a lot of prints that uh, that we had kept for ourselves, and these uh, we've uh, donated to the uh, Crow's Nest Pass Museum. Mm -hmm. And they will be available for people to see uh, at any time that they want. Arrangements are being made in that line now. And, and are all these uh, marked so people know who we well, the pictures? Well, the, uh, there was a group working at the uh, consortium in the pass this summer, and they did a lot of cataloging. They cataloged practically all the things that my sister had at her place. So most, most of the pictures that were left over from the studio have been cataloged now. I think of what a tra tragedy it is when uh, some of these old photographers, uh, I remember even just a few years ago when they, the silver prices went out of whack and uh, there were local photographers, long established ones that'll go unnamed 
that actually got rid of their stuff be for the silver price or whatever they get. Yeah. From it. But uh, I'm glad to see there are some of these, like the Ernest Brown collection, that have, have been preserved for the province. Well, they, uh, they will be well preserved. Uh, uh, Glenbow uh, has a big job on their hand identifying things, cataloging them as well. And uh, they are using our pictures in a, well, it quite extensively. Uh, the only thing that, uh, that pops up is you see your, your photograph and then you see photos courtesy Glenbow Museum. The original photographer is never mentioned. He just ceases yeah. to exist uh, once that uh, takes place. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I don't uh, know. the thing is that at the Crowsnest Pass uh, Interpretive Center at Frank, uh, there are many of our pictures uh, on exhibit there, and in some places they weren't able to uh, erase or take off my father's uh, credit that he had printed on the negatives. So we know for sure those are his, and we know the others are too, but the general credit still goes courtesy yeah. Glenbook, and right. uh, we, uh, we can't fight that. Uh, I don't know what the justification is for doing <laughs> that, but uh, I guess that's another story. Right. Um, the, oh, here's the one we're looking for. I'll get a close-up here. Uh, here's Evan with his beetle haircut. You see this right here? Just tip it forward. That's yeah. Right there. I know he looks like a little girl, but he's not a little girl. He's a little boy. <laughs> How old were you when you... Well, I was 12 when I had my first haircut. I see. And I had uh, whitish, I guess whitish blonde hair for the longest while. Would this picture have been taken in the studio? This was taken in the Blairmore studio. One of the first family pictures uh, when we moved down to Blairmore in 1928. Now, would that be that would be all natural light, would it, or not? Absolutely natural. If, when you look at a picture, can you tell that it's a natural light? Um, there, if there's been a little supplement of, day, of artificial light thrown in, uh, it, sometimes we had to use some of that when people would come very late and there wasn't enough daylight, so we arranged the uh, flood lamps, and you can tell the, tail, the, the shadows that are cut they're harder shadows. Now, if soft illumination is used, say electric or electronic, uh, it's pretty hard to tell it from natural daylight. The, uh, the one thing that gives it away is the, the, uh, the catch lights that are picked up in the eyes. The uh, catch lights from daylight are different than they are from pinpoint sources of light. There you go, folks. Next time you can, <laughs> you could have a study of just yes know, on that on alone. Um, here's your mother. Uh, she took pictures too. Yes, she was uh, my father's right arm, you might say, uh, when he wasn't available, <laughs> and usually he wasn't available if he was chasing clouds. Yes, was we talked about that before. He was after the getting the crow just the way he wanted it, you know. So anyway, if something came up she took the pictures and or if he were sick you know but uh, she could do everything that he could do besides that she did the bulk of the printing and developing now this camera that she seems to be using here is that uh, fold-up type camera that was uh, quite Let's common see. during the um, oh. 20s, 30s? Oh, okay this was the uh, the old English climax it's a focusing camera the quarter plate three and a quarter, four and a quarter, and we used that in the studio as well as for copy work and everything. Well, but uh, this would be the one that you would focus with, and you, you had to use that on a tripod. Oh, this, so this is, the, although it looks somewhat the same type of camera that they actually used to just carry with them when they went on picnics. You, you, you could take that one and use it that way because it also had a viewfinder at the front mm. and preset it and focus it that way. But you, you could do very t technical work with it mm. on a tripod. Have you been a collector of, um, of cameras? Were you a camera uh, collector? I have been. At, at, at one time, I... Uh, I had everything from a Minox to 1114 view. And I used to take this to the lecture rooms when I was giving the courses. And uh, it, it took several boxes to bring everything in, you know. And uh, th then one time, I just got really pooped out with <laughs> lugging all that stuff around. And I decided I wasn't going to do it anymore. Well, what are some of the, um, this is just a picture of, again of your 
mother and dad obviously in the studio but um, let's have a look at some of the clippings that you brought before time runs out on us and we can't get around to doing it well this particular picture is the one that they have used on the commemorative coin the Coleman Museum and it's a picture of my mother in our car mm -hmm. that old 1918 model T Ford uh, around the crow's nest lake this is before they ever had paved roads they just had a rough trail there and uh, it's one of the uh, few pictures of my mother <laughs> in the car <laughs> but my father took this for the scene but he he, he wanted to have that in there as well for huh. added interest now this uh, is going this is going uh, east i guess no we're it? heading towards coleman here yeah, east, that's yeah. right. East. So it's where the road is today yeah. still, mm -hmm. it's in the same location. This is very close to the place where they've dedicated the Crow's Nest Pass oh, yeah. uh, area. Mm -hmm. And this shows the studio around 1931-32. Now okay. the corner in there wasn't filled in yet and that turned out to be my photo engraving room. We built that in, and uh, I did my coloring and framing and photo engraving in that. And it shows how the studio looked there, and uh, I don't know whether we have one here. And this, of There's course, a picture is of um, what it looks like today. Yeah? Well, it, it's not. It's, that's the way it looked just when the historical society took it over. Oh, I see. You see. Okay. Now this, uh, this but is a magazine, Western People, which yes. comes out with uh, Western uh, producer. That's magazine, right, mm -hmm. out, of, out of Saskatoon. And this is the the shot that they yeah. featured of my father's. The famous, the famous shot. Maybe famous you could tell shot. us about that, Evan. Well, uh, at the time that he took this, we already had a Model A Ford, which was the last guy my father had. And uh, my father put the bulk of the mileage on that car, running back and forth from Blairmore to the Crow, Crow's Nest Lake to get that picture. And uh, it was several thousand miles anyway. But he didn't mind sparing, the, he didn't spare the horses, you know, getting out there because he got to the point where he could sense the weather conditions in Blairmore would be so and so. And by the time he would get over there, he knew that he would have a reflection at the lake. And it worked out that he was able to hit the jackpot uh, on several occasions. This being one, and then the other one being a springtime one uh, with the ice, mm -hmm. snow covered ice flows on the lake. Well, is that a problem uh, that there usually the lake wasn't that still? Is oh, that no, it, that's a very windy spot. Mm. You always have, it's a big wind tunnel right through there. Yeah. So the, getting that lull is, is, is quite a thing. You don't have very many quiet moments around the lake. You know, it's possible, uh, Evan, that they put the picture in upside down. Maybe well, this is the way. Well, some people have had them hung yeah. upside down at home. Didn't realize it till they went. To You're sure you got it in year. right, eh? Because <laughs> I'm not sure. The, uh, no. I was going to ask you about he, this. And one here, here we have the dedication of the of the uh, building after it had been we, refinished revamped. This is the uh, magazine of the Historical Resources Foundation. That's right, isn't it? a cornerstone. Well, it's really nice that uh, so many people have taken an interest in the studio. It must oh, be definitely. Very grateful, gratifying to you. And uh, then this one shows the Crozeness Pass Symphony in the studio. Oh, okay. And uh, all 75 members, eh? Well, yeah. <laughs> what, I, what, what I would like to see is, is more music uh, activity to take place there, you know. But uh, I don't know. That's up to the people up in the past to decide what, they, uh, what they're going to do. We're just making a suggestion, folks. Right. Now, so far as the music is concerned, uh, let's see, we'll take this one here. There was our program of the Crowsness Pass Music Festival. 1943. Kindly uh, retain this program. Well, you did well, what they asked, well, didn't you? you did what they <laughs> <laughs> And then this is the welcome sign that I made. I made a cut of that. What do you mean you made a cut of it? Uh, a printing cut, a wood block uh, with the zinc uh, printing plate on it. 
in the photo engraving part of the studio. Oh, you didn't use a Macintosh and just... Uh, oh, no, no. <laughs> this was the state of the art in those days. I see. And uh, you, ha you worked with zinc plate a sixteenth of an inch thick and a wooden block of a certain dimension. So when you put the two together, they made up a type high uh, block for printing. It was the same mm -hmm. height as your type so that when you put that in with the rest of the printing in the pr you know, press, mm -hmm. you, uh, you had everything the same height. So I designed that and I made that one. And I also made this one on the back page here where I'm advertising violin and repairs and bow rehearing. So I had mm -hmm. to draw the business first and then photograph that and then make the cut on zinc and then mount it and so that it was printable. So how long would it take you to actually do the process to make up that? Um, The actual photographing and cutting, you, you could uh, do it within the hour sometimes. As long as Murphy wasn't around, mm. you, you could do it within the hour. And, uh, but you did the etching with nitric acid, and uh, you're always exposed to the fumes of the acid. Oh so sometimes gosh. you, if you were doing a lot of work, uh, you'd have to leave it for a while to get some fresh air. So how did you know when it was time to get fresh air, when you had to pick yourself well, up when off you, the floor? Well, when your sputum comes out <laughs> yellow, oh, you, know, you know you've got to get out of it. It, 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 it wasn't uh, too healthy. There must be a lot of people that suffered with, got into that profession for a while. Well, in, in the engraving and in the printing trade, yes, yeah. Did your dad um, always have the same, um, I don't want to use the name, fanaticism, <laughs> that's not the word, but was he always very, very interested in, the, in his photography in the same way, you know, people seem well, to we have could, spurts, we, could, we could call it obsessions, <laughs> which is a kinder word. Uh, yes, uh, two weeks before he died, he was still uh, uh, discussing how he was going to work with some of the new Kodak paper that was mm -hmm. just being introduced. And so he, right he from, never he never gave up. Uh, you know, a lot of us we go through our photography stage and we go through this stage and that stage. But he was basically no. Into he sta it the he whole stayed he stayed with it. It never it never left him. And uh, the same thing for his music. He wanted us kids to have music. Uh, Polly took the piano. Prask was on violin. Nadia and I were on mandolin, and we were playing in the mandolin orchestra in 1920 in Coleman. And, uh, mandolin. Maybe you better tell us what a mandolin is. Some of us the mandolin is an eight-stringed instrument. It's tuned the same as a violin, E A D G, except you have two strings for each note, and uh, for each pitch. Is it like a guitar? And it's like a guitar. It has. It's a fretted instrument, and you play it with a pick, with a plectrum or a pick, and uh, you. Uh, are they still just sort of use that action? Are they still action. popular? Or are they more or less? Um, Jethro, and who was it on the? Um, yeah. Somebody in Jethro. In that um, country music, mm -hmm. they uh, they pl play the mandolin. In fact, you see a quite a quite a bit of mandolin playing. On, Could you? Was, would there be? It must be carryover from a mandolin to a, a guitar. Eh? I mean, well, one you, can uh, you can do cording with a mandolin as well as mm -hmm. well as play melody and you can do that on the guitar but I think you can do it easier on the mandolin because the frets are arranged uh, on a different basis the strings are arranged differently as well your continuity from one string to the other is, is, is free-flowing then you see mm -hmm. and uh, same as a violin because I was on the mandolin and then I started on the violin by myself we had this little half size uh, on the wall there I tuned it up to the mandolin pitch and hacked away at it and uh, hacked away that's a good <laughs> it was a, it was a complete surprise to my father uh, see we lived in Coleman my f folks had a studio in Coleman and one in Blairmore originally and in 1928 of course we moved to Blairmore because more people were coming to the Blairmore studio and uh, so uh, my grandmother was looking after us in Coleman while my father and mother worked mm -hmm. in Blairmore in the mm. earlier years. So anyway, when they came home on this one weekend to do some work up there, I surprised them by playing a tune on the violin. <laughs> and what I played was one of the old old country, well, let's call them blues tunes that my mother or grandmother hummed for me. And uh, it really surprised my father. 
Well, I guess we've pretty well run out of time. But for those of you that uh, would like to know more about uh, the building that we're talking about, I'd suggest that uh, you take a trip to the Crow's Nest Pass and look up the Gushel, uh, what do they call it, Gushel Museum or Gushel, what do they call well, it? Well, just the Gushel Photo Studio, they call it. Uh, Gushel Conservatory, it seems to me I heard that name somewhere along the line too. But anyway, name the, name the word Gushel and people will know what you're talking about and it's well worth seeing. It's quite a building. So we'll see you next week, everybody, and remember, Thanks, Evan, for coming, and thanks for watching, and next week we'll again find out who's who in Southern Albert. See you next week.